Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Today is a day to celebrate today, the day where we are hosting the sixth uh, Youth Adaptation Network, and in this opportunity is for the MENA region, a region that is highly vulnerable to the impacts of climate change, but also a region with a young population leading adaptation and climate change solutions. My name is Adriana Valenzuela. I am the Youth Leadership and Education Program Lead at the Global Center on Adaptation. The Global Center on Adaptation is an international organization that was established as a solution broker. We establish partnership with governments, academic institutions, NGOs, youth organizations to accelerate adaptation action. And also GCA through its uh, youth leadership program is empowering youth to make, uh, to implement adaptation solutions, but also to develop the knowledge and skills to act as a leaders in their communities. Today, we have a very exciting agenda and a special thanks to all our partners, the Arab Youth Climate Movement of Qatar, the Libya Youth Climate Council, Act Sustainable, also the Arab Youth Sustainable Development Network of Yemen, and many other organizations that are part of this effort. This event is also a preparatory event for COP27 that will be hosted by ETIC, the COP of Adaptation and the African COP. We have a very exciting agenda. We have uh, speakers from different countries in the MENA region. We have an intergenerational dialogue about what is needed to accelerate the adaptation agenda. Also, we will showcase some concrete adaptation solutions and we will have a dynamic uh, exercise to design together uh, how a MENA region will uh, look like in 2030, uh, taking into account that it will be a climate resilient region and what actions are needed. Then we will start with a welcome video from the CEO of the Global Center on Adaptation, Professor Fatih Perkoje. Then uh, let's watch the video. Dear friends, welcome to the MENA Youth Adaptation Forum, the last but one in a series of seven taking place around the world. At UN climate negotiations in Bonn recently, young leaders like yourself from Qatar, Libya, Egypt, Tunisia and the United Arab Emirates, specifically you asked for a MENA Forum. And with the MENA region taking center stage at COP27 in Egypt in November, it's only right that we have a youth adaptation forum here too. Indeed, young people everywhere are putting the climate emergency at the top of the political agenda. You are demanding more ambitious action, and rightly so. Because the science tells us that we need urgent and deep and bold action to avert an impending catastrophe. Mitigating global warming requires an energy revolution. But what? What about the climate impacts that are already posed in clear and present dangers? We don't hear much about it, but Syria is, for example, is currently facing its worst drought in 70 years. Millions of people there, and for example in Iraq, are losing access to water, food and electricity because of rising temperatures, record low levels of rainfall, and as a consequence, immense drought. Mitigation might at some future point in time prevent these losses, but right now, right here, with more frequent and intense extreme weather events occurring, adaptation is the only viable response to clear and present danger. So raising the alarm over the need to mitigate is no longer enough. We need you, our young people, to bring the same energy to calling loud and clear for our action on adapting to the changes we see taking place all around us. MENA's youth population will double in size by the middle of the century to approximately 271 million. And you know, in numbers there is strength, which is why young people like yourself have an incredible potential 
to be drivers of climate adaptation action. And for that reason, we need to get young people involved in campaigning and working for a climate resilient world. And by doing that, we also need to create adaptation jobs and expand the economic opportunities available to young people. And that is precisely what the GCA, the Global Center on Adaptation, is doing. By promoting sustainable job creation through our Youth ADAPT program, which will help to grow 10,000 youth-owned enterprises. And on top of that, we are equipping a million, one million young people with the skills for climate resilient jobs. COP27 has been called the COP of adaptation. It has been called the COP for Africa. The world is looking at your region to lead on climate adaptation. It's vital that you take your seat at the conference table and have your voices heard. I wish you all the best in your deliberation. I thank you. Thank you. It's an invitation to all the participants. Also, if you want to introduce yourself using the chat function. And also, I would like to mention that we have interpretation. The interpretation will be available in English, French, and Arabic. You can use the icon at the bottom that mentioned interpretation and just uh, use the channel that is required. We are also honored to have a video message, a keynote video message from the Minister of Climate Change and Environment of the United Arab Emirates. As mentioned, the MENA region is hosting two of the most important climate change conferences this year, the COP27, and next year, COP28. Let's then uh, watch the video from his uh, or from the Minister of Climate Change. Your Excellencies, our young leaders, ladies and gentlemen, it is a pleasure to address you today. And I thank the Global Center on Adaptation for inviting me and for the hard work they do to make the world a safer and sustainable place in light of the fast progressing climate crises. Just last week, parts of the UAE were hit by climate change induced heavy rainfall and flash flooding that put people's lives at risk and damaged hundreds of houses and properties. This is just one example of the devastating climate impacts witnessed all over the world. This shows the importance and the urgency of driving the global goal on adaptation as a way of making us all resilient to climate change impacts. The MENA region is among the world's most vulnerable to climate change, with projections of even higher temperatures and increased water stress. Raising our region's climate adaptive capacities is a priority that can only be achieved with the help of our youth. For young people, it's personal. It's their future at stake. Their determination to be engaged in developing climate change adaptation solutions that prepare us for what's to come is evident. But it's the responsibility of those at the helm to give them the opportunity to be in charge of their own future and make sure their voices are heard when charting a global roadmap to a climate resilient future. Ladies and gentlemen, the next two COPs are taking place in the MENA region, and we are pleased to see the COP27 presidency place more emphasis on youth participation in the highly anticipated event later this year. With the UAE hosting COP28 in 2023, we are committed to ensuring a meaningful participation and inclusion of youth into decision-making processes. We will make sure young people are present at the negotiation table, side by side with our senior government officials. We believe the young generation has the right to have a say in shaping its future. We were very impressed with the level of knowledge and engagement of youth delegates at COP26 last November in Glasgow. And we expect them to show up at COP27 and COP28 with the same if not higher, level of passion to become change agents. We have no doubt about their ability to bring fresh perspectives and insights that will add significant value to climate negotiations at the next two COPs. At COP28, 
we will have the first global stock take of the Paris Agreement and we must implement it effectively as it will be one of our main pillars of delivery. As part of the process, we will review the global progress on the global goal on adaptation to know exactly where we stand and inform our next steps. To create a positive future for the next generation, we urge all countries to step up in the remaining time till COP28 and enhance their adaptive capacities. The UAE stands ready to collaborate with all countries to strengthen climate adaptation commitments and achieve tangible progress in implementing them. Climate action is an all-inclusive process. We need everyone on board, particularly our young leaders, if we are to succeed. I have high hopes in our young people, and I'm confident they will achieve great milestones in strengthening the global climate resilience. Together, we will be at the forefront of building a climate-safe, brighter future. Thank you. Thank you to the keynote uh, speech of the Minister of Climate Change and Environment. And as you know, the Paris Agreement, this international agreement that was agreed by parties in 2050, highlight the importance of adaptation and invites, uh, makes a call to the global goal on adaptation. And the Global Center on Adaptation has been organizing youth adaptation forums uh, in different regions to put together decision makers and young leaders to discuss what is needed and how we can make our planet more climate resilient. We will have now an intergenerational dialogue reflecting on the recommendations of youth about the global goal on adaptation. Then uh, we have an extraordinary panel because youth are not the leaders of tomorrow, youth are leading by examples and also are youth the leaders of today. And I am delighted to welcome two extraordinary leaders. Uh, the Minister of Environment mentioned that we, she wants to bring youth as part of the negotiations, as part of the decision-making process. We have two of them. And I am delighted to welcome Nisarin El Sayayim. She's the chair of the UN Secretary General a youth advisory group on climate change. She's from Sudan. She is one of the young leaders leading the uh, climate change agenda, but also is a committed young woman leading transformations in uh, her country. Then, um, also our second speaker uh, is Ahmed El Haed Tayi. He's from the Youth Climate change um, is a youth climate change activist, but also is a negotiator on the global goal on adaptation. And he is from Tunisia. He also took the leadership as part of the climate change meeting to bring this topic about organizing a dedicated forum for the MENA region. And I have some questions for you. I would like uh, first to welcome, uh, I would like that you very briefly uh, start with a quick question about how did you start how did you get involved in this climate change agenda? And after that, then we will go to three key questions to go more in deep about your vision, about the global goal on adaptation, the impacts in the MENA region of climate change, but also what is needed to strengthen youth participation in the decision-making process. The initiative, how did you start? How did you get involved in this process? Uh, thank you, Adriana, for the introduction. I'm very glad to be here with you today. Um, I started 10, 10 years ago. <laughs> I know it's long. I, I don't even imagine. Um, I didn't know also in 2012, I started January 2012, that I will spend 10 years doing climate change. Uh, uh, it, it, it's been a very interesting and long journey. Uh, I don't feel it's long now, but um, I know I'm a bit old in the field. Um, and how it happens, it's basically uh, we had uh, political problems in Sudan, as usual. Um, and um, so universities were closed for three months just because of the political problems. And I had a lot of time. I didn't know what to do. I was a freshman uh, at that time. And um, I was uh, doing physics in my undergrad. I have a bachelor degree in physics. So I was thinking how to link science with policies and, uh, and uh, political decision making in the country. And I used my favorite friend, which is Google. 
Uh, and in Google, I was thinking how I was searching how to link science and uh, political uh, science together, natural sciences and political science. Uh, so I discovered something called science diplomacy, which is using science in diplomatic discussions. And the two major topics at that time uh, of science diplomacy were actually water because countries share water together. So they need to have a diplomatic discussion on how to manage and who gets what share and, and so on. And the second bigger topic was, of course, climate change, uh, because it's a very scientific problem, yet it's because of the huge interest and the huge um, financial implication of it, uh, it, it became a very political problem. So uh, this is how I started actually doing climate change. Um, I, I know it's different and I know it's far ago, 10 years ago. <laughs> But um, I mean, science was my entrance uh, to the field. That's why for me, science is not neg negotiable. Fantastic. Then, Ahmed, what about you? How did you start and how did you get involved in this process? Well, thank you, Adriana, for organizing this. And thank you for the Global Center for Adaptation for giving us the chance to be on the first edition of the Youth MENA Adaptation Forum. I'm happy to be with you here with uh, some inspiring and amazing leaders from the MENA region from all around the world that are following us. So uh, it's, we're not far, far from each other in the scene for me as well. I started from the, the door of science or the field of science. I started uh, studying in college uh, environment protection, science of, uh, science of environment. And after that, like uh, I was passionate since I was, as a kid about uh, environment, animals and everything. And since I started studying about climate change, I felt responsible for not doing anything. So I've, I became a climate activist with uh, some amazing youth in Tunisia. After that, I've uh, started con connecting with uh, youth from uh, all around the world and started organizing things and how to change things from the outside and from the inside. And last year, um, our Tunisian focal point, UNFCCC focal point, uh, with the, the, the help of GIZ, opened an application uh, to create this group of young negotiators. And uh, I was like, you know, only criticizing people who are doing negotiations and they are not doing anything. So I said, let me try to change things from the inside. And yeah, I was uh, selected and I joined the group of young negotiators. And right now we are a group of 11, I believe. In Tunisia, we are uh, co-leading the negotiations in uh, different thematics. And yeah, uh, right now I'm co-leading the negotiations in uh, about the GGA, the Global Goal Adaptation. If, if I may jump, if I may jump here, Adriana, Ahmed, uh, uh, remind me of something. I, I think it was 2014. Yes, it was 2014. Um, <laughs> I remember it was um, the first time I really wanted to go to a COP and um, I had to actually go and camp in front of the of the focal point office to get accreditation. <laughs> I, I was like, I'm, I'm striking here. I'm not moving if I didn't get accreditation to go. Um, and the problem is in 2014, um, I was just above the age because I, I started university a bit early. Uh, in 2012, uh, I was 16. So in, in 2014, I was only a few days after I finished my 18. I was like, you are almost a minor. I said, well, almost. I'm not a minor anymore, so I want to go. Uh, and it took us actually seven years to manage to bring more young people on board uh, to go to COPS with us. So I think um, I think Ahmed and many other countries were really uh, privileged and really lucky to have the, um, the initiative from the focal point and from GIZ as a fu like funding their opportunities, because even us, we had to always fun fundraise to participate in the events and so on. Um, so I guess um, different people have different um, uh, starts, but it's really struggle for a lot of people to to find an opportunity and an, a window to 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 open uh, and uh, to participate uh, for for events, especially for COP. Okay. And then let me ask you, what uh, from your perspective, what are these impacts that the MENA region? Uh, is facing regarding climate change. And let's try to be very brief. In this way, I will, can, I, I will have also other questions for you. Then, uh, I mean, what are the impacts that you have seen in the MENA region? Uh, unfortunately, as you, as you know, like everybody knows, the MENA region is one of the hotspots of climate change. It means like we're facing right now uh, severely and extremely the impacts of climate change. It means that the MENA countries are very vulnerable to climate change impacts as they are naturally affected by harsh climate conditions since like uh, uh, the beginning. Uh, 
uh, like extremely high temperatures, limited groundwater uh, and rainfall and scarce agriculture and their arable land. And this is due to the combination of water and precipitation scarcity. Also the high population growth and geographic uh, concentration of the population. This is the most water stressed area in the world, as you know, and climate change has already been observed in the region uh, and is expected to accelerate and uh, intensify in the near future, amplifying those stressors already at play and evidence collected by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the APCC, uh, indeed confirms an overall warming process, both in terms of annual and seasonal average temperatures. The number of days with heat waves right now and the drop of precipitation in recent decades in North Africa, uh, although definitely with some uh, geographical uh, variation and uh, differences, which cannot uh, be explained by natural variability. The region is also predicted to experience future drying trends and temperature increasing at a faster rate than the global uh, la land average, not only in terms of annual and seasonal average, but also in terms of heat waves. In other words, this region, which plays the host to extensive semi-arid and desert uh, temperatures and to water crisis and chronic shortages. And the consequences, unfortunately, are likely to be severe in the next few years, and uh, not only for the economic activities, but also for health and human life. According to a recent study in 2018, uh, even if global warming is limited to two uh, degrees Celsius, and this is in, uh, mentioned in the uh, one of the goals of the Paris Agreement, unfortunately, the heat stress mortality risk for people aged over 65 is estimated to increase by th three to seven times by 2,100. And we're talking here about the objective of the Paris Agreement, which is two point degrees Celsius. Also, the MENA countries are also particularly vulnerable to sea level rise, as you know. Due to climate change, about 7% uh, of the total uh, population lives uh, in areas where elevation in, is less uh, than five meters above sea level and a large share of economic activities, uh, major urban centers, agriculture and population is concentrated in the coastal areas, which are exposed to increasing risk, risks of flooding. Uh, inundation and land erosion and uh, we have a bigger problem right now even in Tunisia which is salinization uh, and the effect of sea level rise could be extremely uh, disparative for climate sensitive activities from tourism, agriculture and fishing which are a lot of uh, countries in the MENA region are depending on these fields uh, and in the Mediterranean and Red Sea subregion that are uh, characterized by the rich biodiversity and tourism at attractiveness a comparative study on 84 coastal developing countries, for instance, estimated that about 24% of the MENA uh, coastal GDP and 20% of its uh, coastal urban extent are exposed to sea level rise and storm surges. And uh, this is what's happening right now in the MENA region, unfortunately, uh, due to climate change impacts. Excellent. Thanks a lot, Amit. And, uh, and Misery, from your side, what other climate change impacts have you seen? in the MENA region? Uh, I think Ahmed summarized most of it, uh, but I just want to add um, two things. First of all, the impacts of climate change are two parts. One is climatic, and this is what most of the Ahmed mentioned, like uh, the heat wave, like the rain and the rise of the sea level, and etc. But the most important and the one we don't really focus a lot on is the non-climatic factor, which is mostly the social factor. Um, uh, uh, the last year um, and even the next year, I will be much, very much focusing on two, two very important synergies, uh, which is climate peace and security and how climate change is impacting human security and its relations to um, not conflict over natural resources, but also um, how uh, shifting to renewable energy might actually reduce the conflicts uh, because most of the oil and gas industry goes to weapons. Um, so for me, uh, climate change, peace and security, and thank you, Lily, because she wrote to me in the, um, on the comments that she saw me speaking about the linkages, uh, which is something not a lot of people talk about on how climate change uh, contribute to conflicts. And as coming from a country that very not very much is stable as Sudan, I know that climate change really impacts people double uh, because they don't have a governance structure, there is no a lot, uh, not a lot of policies in place, and even if there is a lot of policies, uh, we don't find finance for it because they say you don't have a government, for example, or you have a lot of corruption, for example. Um, so uh, 
uh, the non-climatic factor are really impacting people and i think we have we need to do uh, a bit more uh, search uh, on them uh, like poverty like lack of policies and lack of um, management because you cannot manage what you cannot predict and climate change is very much unpredictable um thank you and then now let's move a bit more to talk about making the disconnection about the impact and the connection with uh, people what are the, the challenges that you have faced you have to participate in the adaptation agenda and in the decision making process and i will suggest uh, that you have uh, brief responses to go also to the other questions then Amit. so as i was as i was saying like um, to be honest before the initiatives of uh, of the focal point on say the ministry of environment there was uh, not like a, a big uh, contribution or big participation of youth inside the Tunisian delegation. And uh, I always wondered why, like, uh, and I've seen like in delegations, there are a few youth, but the most are experts, are senior experts. There are, there's no big participation of youth inside negotiations room. And I was saying, uh, this is our future. We are the ones who are being impacted for climate change. We need to be there. We need to def defend ourselves. We need to talk and we need to defend future generations. And after the after my first participation at COP26, and I had like this this opportunity, uh, which I'm really grateful uh, to participate as a part of the Tunisian delegation and to be inside the negotiation sessions, uh, defending my country, defending uh, my group, defending the MENA region, the African group, defending the youth of the whole world, trying to speak, trying to. Uh, to contribute in advancing the climate negotiations because it's really uh, not easy. It's really hard uh, process in uh, trying to advance, trying to push further, trying to uh, to push for concrete actions. As you know, we are really talking, but we are not walking the talk, unfortunately. And this is what I try to do. I try to be inside the system. I try to change. And definitely, if other, uh, let's say, delegation insisted on uh, including youth inside the delegation. It's gonna be a huge win because youth they don't have any like let's say lobbies or any uh, political backgrounds. They will be there for the cause. Definitely, a uh, few let's say capacities are required. You need to to have like uh, an idea about negotiations. You need to to be uh, to understand what is the topic that you are negotiating about. You need to be an expert in that topic. But as well, you need actually to be there for the cause because I'm seeing a lot of. Uh, I don't want to say it, but that's the reality. A lot of uh, delegations, a lot of delegates, they, they, they are there because they have a mission. Maybe to block negotiations, maybe to uh, speak for some lobbies, to speak for some big uh, companies. And I don't like that, unfortunately. And I believe if young, uh, if delegations and uh, insisted on the participation of youth, definitely we're going to move forward with negotiations and we're going to achieve uh, let's say the goals of the agreements that we already have. Thank you. Yes, it, uh, I was laughing because uh, what Ahmed mentioned is exactly why negotiation is there. People come with agenda and they want their agenda to go through and that's why it's called negotiations. Uh, I, they don't have to come with a good uh, intention all of the time. And I remember we had a meeting with Mr. John Kerry, the um, American climate envoy, and I told him uh, we were very happy with the new Biden administration. We thought things will change after the, the Trump time. Um, but uh, you know what uh, change? And he said, what change? He was so uh, happy and excited about it. I said, instead of uh, the American delegation says, well, unfortunately, we cannot accept this. Now they say, well, unfortunately, we cannot accept this. <laughs> so <laughs> they don't accept it in both cases, but it was with a very bad like look before in the in the Trump, and now it's with a smile and very happy faces. <laughs> but the position in the action negotiation did not change much, and this is a bit disappointing. Uh, but uh, I think my my main problem is the opposite to uh, what also Ahmed mentioned. It's actually youth washing. Um, I am very grateful for all of the opportunities I get and a lot of people get, um, young people I mean, but we uh, did a recording for all of the youth participations since the Earth Summit um, in, uh, in Rio. And unfortunately we noticed that 
they always do the same pattern. They invite it, they invite one young person to speak to the panel. Um, and normally this young person has to look different than the other panelists. So for sometimes I get invited to uh, panels just because uh, I'm, 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 I'm African and I'm a female, I'm a Muslim and I'm a young person and they normally have all white men panels. Um, and uh, unfortunately, this is it, it's improving because we have more young people coming on board, but it's it's lose the legitimacy of the participation of young people. We are not there as a decoration or just to the diverse the panels or diverse the negotiation. We are there because we really have a technical capacities. We have brains that works and we can actually contribute to the negotiation process. And I'm sure that um, Yongos did more submissions than most of the uh, actual countries and actual parties to the UNFCCC. I know because I was part of uh, many uh, of their submissions in the past, and I'm sure that they continue submitting on, on agenda items. So um, we really, we, we're working on inclusion of young people. Now we need to work on meaningful inclusion of young people. Uh, there is a lot of delegations that uh, have young people in their delegation, but they are either um, invited to, to listen only so they cannot contribute, or uh, they give them like a secretariat uh, a mission of writing notes or printing papers or something, and they don't give them the lead to take the negotiation to the next step and stuff like this. So for me, avoiding youth washing and having real actual meaningful participation of young people is something we really need to work on. Uh, and I'm grateful that this is the next step. First of all, we're talking about youth participation. Now we're talking about meaningful youth participation. But I hope it doesn't take as long as it took us to have youth participation in the first place. That's it. And let me connect this with the last question that I have for you. And the question is, what can governments do to support this meaningful youth participation? And the second one will be, from your perspective, now governments are negotiating the global goal on adaptation. From your perspective, what will be these priorities from the MENA region? Then over to you, Am. So uh, it is a good question, actually. And Janice, yeah, I'm with you because I've seen, to be honest, uh, uh, at this B56 or at COP26, I've seen like youth are there inside the rooms, but they are not talking. They don't have the right to talk, maybe. They have the badge of party overflow, or even either they have the badge of party, but they are not allowed to talk. It's not the case for us in the, in the Tunisian delegation, because uh, to be honest, they provided for us capacity building. We've been like in two severe sessions of training to, you know, to increase our capacities and uh, to be ready for negotiations and to know uh, what are the priorities for the group, for the African group, or for, the, for our country? I believe the first thing that uh, governments and uh, country leaders should do is to believe in the youth, to know that they have the capacities to be there. They need to be there and to select the youth, not just to put the youth, the youth there as a decor, you know? They are there, we are supporting youth, and this is enters inside the, the, uh, the youth watching that Ms. Reen mentioned. Unfortunately, I hate that so much because, because a lot of governments uh, and entities, let's say, organizations as well, are using this, are using the youth. Yes, we are welcoming the youth, we are supporting the youth, but they don't have, they don't give the right to, for the youth to, to express this, uh, themselves, you know? The first thing uh, is to believe in the youth, to believe in the need of the youth. They have brains, they can think, they have maybe like, uh, let's say, enlightening ideas to, to, to and uh, added value to be added inside the negotiations room and, uh, and outside of the negotiations room as well. And the second thing is to provide capacity building because you cannot send the youth there without uh, just uh, go and uh, do the negotiations. Now, you need like to provide capacity building, provide trainings, and you need to be with them to encourage them. You need to talk with them. You need to listen with, to them, to their ideas because it is really important to have this debate, let's say. Maybe we don't have, we don't share the same uh, ideas, the same uh, thoughts with the, the seniors or with the older generation, but it is really important to have this debate. It is really important to listen to each other because we're gonna teach them things and we're gonna learn things from them. And this is the main idea. I'm not like saying, let's uh, remove the, uh, or delay the older generation and just be youth inside negotiations room. No, this is wrong. We need like to, to, to be youth experts, senior leaders. We need to, after all, we are all there for a reason. And if uh, we have like the good intention, definitely we'll reach something. Uh, but talking about 
at GGA. And I'm really happy that after seven years since COP21 in Paris, uh, 2015, finally, we are talking about GGA, the Global Goal on Adaptation. And it is really important, especially for, let's say, uh, as a climate like uh, student, I know I, I don't want to say it is really important just for the MENA region, because what I'm wit witnessing right now and what I'm seeing that climate adaptation is a necessity in all the countries of the world. You know, you're seeing the heat waves right now in Europe, you're seeing the droughts in the UE, you're seeing the fires in California, you're seeing the uh, water scarcity problems in the MENA region, we're seeing everything. So adaptation is a necessity for, whole, for, for the whole countries, for all the countries of the world. And a lot of countries, especially developed countries, needs to understand this because I've been inside negotiations room. I won't talk about the drama, I won't talk about the background, the coalition, but I'm gonna say things are not moving that, uh, that much, you know? A lot of countries are not with the adaptation, it needs to take more time, and right now they're focusing on mitigation. No, we need to focus on mitigation and we need to focus on adaptation at the same time. And it is really essential to work on adaptation. We don't have time. Climate change is hitting us as much as it could, as it can. And if we don't act, we're gonna lose everything in a tip of finger, you know? Thank you. Thanks, Amy. Nisari, over to you. Thank you. I think um, there's something we don't talk a lot about also. Uh, you asked, Adriana, how can government help the participation of young people? And as a Sudanese, I say having a government in the first place is a good thing because we are we don't have a government since October, unfortunately. Um, and I, I I'm talking about this is because this is the case in many of the least developed countries and many of the African countries. Um, the most vulnerable countries to climate change are the countries that doesn't have a democracies and the countries that doesn't have um, good governance structure. Uh, I think also climate governance is very important because then even if you have access to finance, even if you have um, policies for adapting with climate change, if you don't have strong institutes to actually implement these policies and to actually manage the projects that you get for adaptation or the finance you, you get, it will be very, very hard. So um, starting from the local level um, of the neighborhood or the village and moving into bigger um, and, and the national level, uh, is is very important to speak about uh, climate governance specifically, even if you didn't talk about good governance in general. And uh, one of the things that we also don't talk about a lot is now after the General Assembly passed the resolution of uh, uh, human human rights and, 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 and clean environment, finally, we can say that uh, climate action is a human right and a uh, clean environment is a human right. And um, congratulations to everyone who advocated very much for this. Um, so this is very important also to have the freedom of speech and the freedom of gathering. And um, because this, the, the only way how we can know how different communities are suffering from climate change, and then we can help the communities to, to, to adapt to it. Uh, regarding the global goal of adaptation, I don't have any technical input from the negotiation part, but I think uh, the three, the triangle of adaptation is have to be complete. Otherwise, the global goal of adaptation will be just a very fancy name uh, on a document, uh, which is, first of all, how is this adaptation going to address the needs of the different communities specifically, because we are not talking about macro level, we are talking about very, very micro level, uh, because every community have very specific needs and very specific addressing to these needs. Um, secondly, financing these adaptation plans, and I remember um, the language in, in COP26 in Glasgow changed from the 100 billion to a trillion, and then after that, the Ukraine war happened, and then the language of, of, of trillion stopped at all. Um, and I remember the G7 meeting and the G20 meeting, both of them were very disappointing regarding uh, financing climate change. Um, 
climate adaptation actually and climate mitigation. And the third pillar will be the mitigation itself because the communities and the world and the environment and the planet will reach a point where there is nothing to be adapted to and we will reach a point of total collapsing. So it's not enough to do adaptation to the climate change because more emissions, more severe climate change will be and then we will have to change all of our adaptation plans um, to manage this severity until we reach the breakout point where there is nothing to be adapted to and, and, and it's total loss and I hope we don't reach this point. So we have to have this triangle together, otherwise the, it, it, it will be just a, a fancy name. Uh, before we, we go, Adrian, I'm sorry for taking long. Uh, I, I remember the Minister of, uh, of Environment and Climate Change of UAE talked about global stock take. And this is a very important thing because we really need to see how are we going to integrate uh, the outcomes of the global stock take to the negotiation session and then to translate it to an actions, whether it's finance, whether it's more reporting on transparency, et cetera, et cetera. And I think young people can lead this on uh, like showing the road to UNFCCC and different parties on how to integrate global stock take within the actual negotiation process. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you very much for these reflections, you know, and also for your leadership as young uh, change makers, but also as negotiators. They, we will continue with this conversation in the MENA region. We are going to showcase concrete experiences about what, are, what is happening in the MENA region with inspiring experience from Yemen, Egypt, Morocco, and Qatar. Then thanks a lot, Minister thanks a lot, Ahmed. And we start with showcasing these good practices I would like to show a video from uh, the UNFCCC Climate Change Secretariat, Yusef Nasef, who is the Director of Adaptation. Let's watch the video. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening. I'm very happy to be addressing the youth constituency on climate change and on the specific issue of adaptation and on what the global goal on adaptation should entail. Now at the outset, allow me to apologize on behalf of all adults for the situation that we and our predecessors over the past 200 years have put the youth in, in, in this um, strange situation where um, you are the first generation to endure the impacts of climate change, but yet the last generation to be able to solve the problem. And you may recall that the science made its mark in 2018 with the IPCC report on the 1.5 by giving us a very short window of action where we have to transform the way we do our business in order to be able to retain what we consider to be a prosperous life or an acceptable life and we are now in peril of even extinction. Now, how can you help and how can the climate process help with visioning such a desirable future where we do not have to worry about climate change perils or other ecological disasters and on the contrary, move into an abundant, sustainable environment and mindset? Now, you know that our negotiating process has identified goals for mitigation well below 2 degrees, preferably 1.5. We have objectives for funding, the 100 billion, and there would be a new number for 2025. And we are still to articulate what kind of vision we want for adaptation and resilience. And this is really important for us to now get the input from the main stakeholders of the future the youth. What is it that you would like to see in terms of a future mindset that would prioritize resilience, that would prioritize sustainability? It's not just a climate change thing. It's climate change and biodiversity and nature stewardship and equity across the world. How can we do that? We'd like to know how you would define the tenets of such a desirable future. Now, this also reflects what kinds of values do we want to instill in the world? What kind of learning would then make us depart 
from the standard educational system that prioritizes extractive economies at the expense of regenerative economies. And within the coming two years, we will have a work stream, the Global Goal on Adaptation, where we will have eight different workshops where inputs from all external entities are welcome. And I look forward to the youth constituency presenting very strongly their own input, insights, aspirations, visions to help us take the right decisions internationally and nationally and subnationally to move our societies to that aspirational world that guarantees all these positive values that define what it means to be permanently sustainable, to be permanently resilient, to have moved towards that regenerative lifestyle to which we all aspire. Thank you very much. And now we will move to another exciting part of this agenda, because youth are implementing solutions. Then I want to welcome four of our panelists. We have four experience, one from Yemen, Egypt, Morocco, and Qatar. We have Amina Bentali, she's an environmentalist and also trainer in sustainable development uh, in Yemen. We have Abdallah Ahmad Afifi, who is the focal point for the Conference of Youth that this year will be celebrating the 17th Conference of Youth and will be and also is one of the members of the Youth Advisory Panel of the Global Center on Adaptation. And we have also Nishat Shafi from the Arab Youth Climate Movement in Qatar and one also of the leaders mobilizing adaptation and climate change solutions. Welcome to this panel. Now, what we want to do is to listen like your experience and the, what the methodology that we will have is each one of you will have around three minutes to share your experience and uh, maybe very briefly you can start with explaining how did you Did we lose Adriana? Yeah, we just did. Yes, yeah. unfortunately. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think um, we can start with the round of introduction until she is here. Okay, I can start. Yep. So, yeah. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Abdullah Madafifi. I'm uh, the co 17 National Focal Point. And I'm here representing uh, ACTS, ACTS Sustainable, which is a social enterprise based in Egypt, working in the field of climate change and uh, raising awareness. We are also the host for uh, local Koi Egypt and also one of the five organizations that is working on the Koi 17, which is the conference of youth that's going to take place in Sharm Sheikh uh, this year before uh, the COP by three days. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm now... Uh, Based in Germany, I have my master's degree. I have exams after two days, and I'm just here because yeah, I I, I want to to always uh, express experience uh, to the young leaders around the MENA region, and I'm really glad uh, that uh, we could succeed to to make this MENA region MENA uh, forum uh, happen. And I I just like recall before Adriana was here, it was just an idea between the four of us uh, in SP last. Uh, uh, June and now we are here live uh, doing it and yeah thank you so much um, maybe uh, Amina yes uh, thank you uh, assalamu alaikum everyone my name is Amina bin Talib I'm from Yemen uh, I am a social entrepreneur uh, I will uh, tell you today about my uh, project it's considered one of the uh, uh, adaptation projects or sustainable projects uh, is the plastic bricks uh, it's related to the waste management and recycling field. Uh, what I want to tell you about is, um, uh, or why this uh, idea happened, it's um, because, um, especially in vulnerable and development countries like Yemen, uh, we really need to, to do some sustainable solutions to uh, 
uh, to reduce the, the emissions uh, or to do some uh, solutions for the adaptation. Uh, because unlike the mitigation, there is no one single universal uh, metric so can capture all the uh, adaptation across the countries. Uh, so regarding to my project, uh, before I started, I asked myself a question, uh, how can uh, I do resilient solution in my country? And this is the advice that I want to give to anyone who has innovations idea or any idea that can help the environment or to reduce or uh, uh, reduce from the climate uh, change actions is always think about the resilience part of your of your ideas or your sol uh, solution and how this can affect the long term uh, adaptation goal thank you fantastic then um Abdallah, please yeah, I, I just help you with this part. So I start my introduction and the, now it's Amina turn and maybe uh, we can go to uh, Manal. I, I'm helping. I'm Super. Helping. <laughs> Thank you, Adela, for helping and um, good luck for your exams. Uh, this has been my first year in university and it's just been a disaster. So like, I, I, I know how it feels. Um, but hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Manal. I'm 18. This is my first year in university. I am a climate activist. I'm based in Afro Morocco and currently I'm involved in three solutions. So I'll be like, I'll try to be quick. Uh, but before talking about the solutions I'm implementing, I wanted to like just quickly say how I started in climate action. Uh, so I started in 2016 when I was 13, but I was aware of climate change way before when I was then. And so we had a science class in school. I was back then in primary school and we studied what is climate change. We studied all of those fancy words like carbon neutrality, greenhouse emissions, sea rising level. Um, but the only thing that we didn't study at the time, we studied the concept, the scientific concept, but the only thing that we didn't study at the time was that climate change was already happening. And so our teacher didn't say that I will be affected. Our teacher didn't say climate change is taking out lives and economies around the world. And then when I was 13, like three years afterwards, I also went to my favorite uh, friend, Google, like Nisreen. Um, and I was asked to do a research a project within the school, which was part of the curriculum about any environmental issue. And I wanted to do something special because everybody was doing pollution. I was like, no, I want to stand out. Uh, and I did climate change. And then that was when I realized that climate change is already happening. And what frustrated me the most is first, the fact that I am the most empowered as a young person. And second, that people are not doing enough about it. Like imagine we have enough science, enough data, enough statistics, but still nobody's doing anything. Well, nobody's not doing enough about it. And at the time it was even worse. There wasn't as much policies, there wasn't as much work, but right now like we're doing progress. And so I decided back then to involve myself in climate action through different organizations. Um, and right now I'm still involved in like pretty much six organizations right now, uh, but I will talk mainly about three. The first one is the African New Climate Hub that I started with in 2019. What we do in the African New Climate Hub is that it's an initiative, it's a platform for young people from all over Africa, and especially from, from North Africa. Well, the Middle East is also included, but not um, highlighted as much as North Africa, because we're from Morocco and Morocco is in North Africa. Um, and so what we do in this platform is that we, um, if we nurture leadership of African and North African people for climate through capacity building workshops, through trainings, through seminars, webinars. And very recently we, la we launched our own incubation program that focused on bringing 16 young people from all over the continent um, to fund in their project and to provide them with mentoring opportunities and networking and capacity skill building opportunities for them to work better on their projects. The second solution that I'm also working with is the Morocco New Government. Um, I've been working previously as a project manager, but right now I'm in my capacity as an advisor. And what we do is that we're working directly with um, a lot of ministries in Morocco, including the Ministry of um, Social Issues, the Ministry of Climate Change, the Ministry of Environment, a lot of ministries, but I'm focusing on the Ministry of Environment. And what we do is that every single two months or three months, we'll prepare a report and a series of recommendations, especially policy recommendations and a series of, evalu of evaluations to the policies of the government. And what we say to the government, here's what you're doing wrong and here's what you can do for young people and for climate adaptation. And well, at the end of the day, it's their choice to accept it or not. But we love to think that um, this such policy reports will at least push um, 
like as, as much as we insist they will just do something because we, we do well, like we send them a lot of reports uh and the last one like i'll be very quick sorry uh the last one is a project that i'm currently implementing in my personal capacity i started it two months ago and it's about um women for climate because women in my community or like at least in my region are very involved in agriculture and agriculture has been very impacted by droughts and by a lot of climate change impacts and so this project is focusing on, I just started this, so like it's still in conceptual uh, early implementation phase. And it's focusing on how to empower these women with tools to make sure that they can adapt and mitigate climate change impacts in um, their community in relation with the intersection between gender inequalities and climate change. And I, there are more solutions I'm involved in, but like I'll, I'll pass it on to Nishad and I'm super excited to be here. Thank you, Manal. Thank you, Abdullah and Emina, for joining today. And thank you, Adriana. Good to have you back. So I'm Nishad, I'm based in Doha. Uh, I founded the Arab Youth Climate Movement Guitar. And basically, back in 2015, when there wasn't much uh, organization leading the Arab Youth in climate and climate solution based. So Arab Youth was formally formed during COP 18 here in Doha in 2012. Unfortunately, it didn't survive in many of the countries, of course, due to many of the issues which the region still persists to uh, have to abide or to get rid of. Uh, so we as our with Climate Omen were basically working with the communities to build their resilience and understanding of climate change way back in 2015 when climate change wasn't a hippie or a buzzword anywhere in the Arab world and it was too political even to governments to work with. And like things have been changed, uh, a lot of organizations moved in uh, and myself, I reached to climate change advocacy and awareness well, not because of Google, but science. I studied my master's in energy and environment, and my research was on climate change variation over South Asia, both on rainfall and sun, as, uh, temperature rates over 100 years. So I was more technically oriented guy from a scientific background coming into climate, was giving me more avenues to discuss and also share the concerns of climate change but from a very science perspective. That also helped me to also how bring more science oriented people to join uh, much of our members in our team are either students from science or life science or from sustainability which is making sure that we have a taking the sound group and uh, um, bring up projects that are uh, important for the community and understanding the climate issues and i would see that from a very very advocacy point of view building their environmental consciousness and how public behavior can be changed so arab youth climate women have been working since then almost seven years now being uh, collaborating with the state of Qatar, the Ministry of Environment, and other regional and national organization. We are happy to be here too. Right? Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, Emily. You, every one of you, have a very impressive uh, background. And the most important is your leadership and your commitment. Then each one of you are leading different initiatives and also uh, are engaged in different organizations. But I would like that you very briefly just share one of these good practices, this experience to help also other youth, not only for the MENA region, but youth that are connected and are listening to this event from all over the world, this experience that you can share. Let's start with Amina. Amina, then please share with you as the experience in general. Okay, the experience wasn't like that easy, especially in Yemen. Um, we have uh, some circumstances because of the conflict and the war. So when you start talking about the environment and the climate change or any solution in this field, people don't accept it very easily because they t they're telling you we want like food, we want security, we want health. We are not like in the position that we can talk about these things. They, they consider it as luxury things. So it is hard to advocate in this side or raise awareness or to talk about any recycling projects because they need uh, another kind of projects like food security or any, uh, things like this. So um, this is was the most challenged thing I faced it and uh, I may even be facing uh, it until now. But uh, the good thing is uh, uh, we are trying to use the project in things that people need it, like, uh, for example, lanterns in rural areas. Uh, here in Yemen, many, uh, many places in the rural areas, they don't have lanterns in their houses. So we are trying to build lanterns in this, uh, in this bricks and also to help women and engaged women. Uh, 
uh, especially for for them like uh, for example we are trying to do a midwifery clinics uh, in these areas that um, that they don't have enough health care so um, this is how the community will accept the project and also will accept the climate change and environmental uh, uh, field Fantastic. Again, very important points, the empowerment of young women and women, and also the land use. Then, uh, Ahmed, now share with us the plans for the COI-17, and also how it is a platform to bring together young people from all over the world and prepare them for the climate change conference, but also for action on the ground. Over to you, Ahmed. You mean Abdullah? Okay, so I, I was waiting for Ahmed to reply. So okay, sorry. Yeah. Uh, so uh, for for us in Egypt, it's uh, it's a bit different because uh, when you start, like I started in, in the climate field since 2016, since the start of SDGs. So it was a bit uh, different approach. For it was like if you are speaking about climate change, people just do not care. So it's not like the first priority you need to put on the table. But uh, they can listen to you once you have like a very concrete or a very idea that are connected to their own lives. So, for example, if I'm going to have a, a relation between um, the water bottle that it's it's in your hand and the 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 beach that you are going to have your vacation uh, uh, in, you are going to be, oh, okay, it's related now. So they need to have like another level of uh, capacity building. You are not going to give them like a border example, like the turrets in the sea are going to die. And this kind of example, you are going to give them more practical example that they can see and feel. For example, the temperature, like now it's it's very hot here in Germany, which is doesn't make any sense. It's 35, so I'm, I'm not in Egypt. So. Uh, yeah, uh, you can just relate to this stuff because you can feel it. So we started to start on the capacity building from uh, a lower uh, a lower level. So we start from schools and the children because these are the people who are uh, going to be affected more uh, rather than us because we are trying to make this planet a safe planet for the this generation, the next generation, and generation afterwards. So we started to go to schools, universities, and to educate people about climate change to have them like, uh, this is uh, the typical uh, solution for the climate is you, you just like start by yourself. So you are not, you are not waiting for decision makers to, to do something for you. You just start by yourself. You change the life of your, uh, the style life that you are having. You don't like uh, consume a lot of energy, uh, water, electricity, and all this stuff. So we started from this perspective, and then we came up with Local Koi Egypt in 2019, which was the first uh, Local Koi uh, in the MENA region, which is a local conference of use. It's related to Yungu. Uh, Yungu is the official use consistency of UNFCCC. And uh, we started to gather people from all around uh, the city of Cairo and Alexandria to just like come and speak about their own projects because we found out that there is our people like us who are working in the shadows. They are just having their own ideas. You have the, their own uh, projects, but they cannot speak up because they don't have the ability. They don't have like this kind of platforms that we are here uh, now, or they don't have like a... Uh, uh, the community to share these ideas with. So we, what we are trying to do as ACTS is to create this community in Egypt to connect all the people who are working in the field uh, together. And we are very glad that last Koi, last local Koi in Egypt, uh, one of the attendees is now um, a founder of a, a social enterprise that's working directly with the Ministry of Energy. So this is this is what we are trying to do and what we are trying to achieve. And also this is all related to uh, the adaptation that I'm going to, to speak uh, 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 more about when we are speaking about Koi. I'm just like going to uh, go deep into uh, many topics, uh, but uh, hopefully people here are um, are aware of Koi and uh, local Koi and uh, this kind of few NFWC process. Sorry, uh, what was the question again? Sorry, I, I was very captivated about what they were saying. I just totally forgot the question. Uh -huh. as, as you, what we would like is to sh that you share one of the experiences, you know, regarding your engagement 
where you are engaged in different organizations, in different initiatives. But now what we want is that you select one and share as an inspiration for others, things that can be done, you already have done, have implemented. I think I answered this question like earlier when I was talking, I was just speaking about all of these solutions. Um, but probably I could like right now focus more on one of those, which is the last one that I'm leading on the personal level. Now I want to focus on this one because um, I want to share like a couple of best practices that I've learned throughout the process of doing something by myself. And I just I just want to tell everyone out there who is doing something like who started a project by themselves, I know how hard it is and I can relate and I have like total appreciation and respect for you because it's just super hard, but, it's, but it is not impossible. And so like the first one is, I was really surprised by the lack of resources that there is in Morocco, not just in Morocco, throughout the world. Because when I started working on this project with five other girls, uh, five, five other young women who are aspiring as well in Morocco, we realized that there's not enough numbers. There's no statistics about climate change in Morocco, or at least in my community, even though Morocco is like a leader in terms of climate performance. And it wasn't just about lack of resources or numbers, but it was also lack of capacity building training programs. It was also like, um, which is what we're doing in the African New Climate Hub, but there was just a lack of resources. And even if there were resources, they were generally not accessible to the general public, but only to for governmental use, for university use, and not for people like us who want to start their own projects. And so like a best practice for me uh, in terms of resources is to, instead of like looking for the resources, we started in this own organization, which is Women for Climate Morocco. We started doing the research by ourselves. So like, don't take the lack of resources as an excuse, but rather do it by yourself. So we started gathering data from experts. We started doing research on the field. And we also started doing life testimonies to understand the climate impacts in our region because we didn't find any um, resources by that, uh, at least in Google or any other outlets. And um, the second best practice is to build your support system. So this is, uh, I, I, don't, I don't, I'm not usually, um, I don't like to be a negative person, but the climate field can be very toxic at times. I remember last year, I just, I was super frustrated because of a lot of negative criticism that I was getting because I was too young to do this. My project was too small. I, um, I don't have enough experience. I don't have enough skills. Um, and it took a toll on my mental health. I, w I had a very long depressive episode actually last year and it affected my health, my academics and my professional attitude as well. And so what I want to say to all of the young people out there, just build your support system, become resilient, because if you're going to work on a project by yourself, or like even within an organization, you're going to have a lot of climate denial, you're going to get a lot of feedback of you're too young or you're too small. And um, you have to be resilient. And remember, at the end of the day, you have a greater purpose than all of those negative criticism. You're here to save the planet and don't let anyone stand in the way of that, even if they're just saying you're too young nobody's too young to make a difference um but pretty much those are like my best practices and like my advice for anyone who wants to get engaged and anyone who wants to save the planet like us thanks a lot Manan. as you say each one of us we need to be all climate resilient then misha over to you uh, thank you. I know what's a great story is from a couple of my colleagues here. So I, I would just share how we have been working with the community here. Some of our recent projects was to actually bring the resilience of the community, how we can build that knowledge. Like you, like uh, Ahmed mentioned, or Abdullah also mentioned, that the, the awareness within the community still lack uh, beyond the, the fancy word of climate change, how, what is resilience, what is climate adaptation, what is mitigation are still very prudent at very early stages to many of the community members. So how to bring those things to align, right? How to see uh, some, of, some of the idea was to how we can bring that in very fast ways, which part of the community we target. So which is schools? Uh, how we can bring young people aware more on the, 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 the impacts of climate change, where exactly it is coming from. Uh, and so that way we introduced a program called um, uh, Measuring Your Carbon Footprint Initiative. Uh, it was a, a, a desktop based or computer or online based initiative where people will have to find out uh, their day-to-day -day 
um, uh, activities and uh, we wanted to find how much is their um, carbon footprint on their day-to-day -day activities. So we collaborated with the Ministry of Education and Ministry of Health to look at the two big spheres, what happens, uh, because the questions included a set of questions from daily activities, from your travel, the food, the waste generated, etc. And the idea was to look at how young people see those on a day-to-day -day basis, because how the impact of individual also contribute to climate change and what they can do. And it is not to uh, individually blame or shame anybody based on their carbon footprint, but to give the sort of a taste how a climate change impacts uh, or the footprint associated with climate change has to come, where it comes from. So if it is your food, if it is your power consumption, if it is travel, just imagine the amount from the energy industry as such or fossil fuel industries. We just wanted to give that sort of comparative and also introduce them to the topic, why we have to build a very climate friendly food system, food networks, climate friendly travel uh, options, uh, climate friendly energy system. So the, the project was in a way well received. More than 2000 students took part. The initiative is still running. We're going to have an award events to school, which actually run the project one time and reduce the mission after finding out that that school had so much of a mission coming from the day-to-day -day activities of the students. So this generated a lot of vibe. The Ministry of uh, Education want to see how, what are the education modalities of this project. Ministry of Health came in to join this project, want to see what is the food consumption pattern for young people in the country looking, you know, given food is one of the critical aspects of changing climate and just to see how vulnerable when we have a war in Ukraine and that completely devastated the, the food grain supplies across the world. Just imagine more disruption out of climate would take place in Ukraine. This is also going to have the same impact like the war. So there's so many aspect where we actually have to build the resilience and understanding of a community. Uh, and like you all mentioned, your projects have its own um, um, importance and uh, doing so such projects really builds the capacity of the community. Yes, government does a lot of activities and programs and uh, uh, come sometime it's um, not reaching to the right target and we are as a young community leaders, we have the right access to those people. We know the language, what they want to hear from us. So it is always important that we speak in the language of community rather than beyond big science topic. Uh, you know, nullifying, breaking down into them and language always helps to reach out to the community. The target is to, of course, one, on the one hand, we make our governments and corporates uh, uh, accountable to what they're doing. And at the same time, building the the resilience and adaptation capacity of our community, which is very crucial moving forward. Just imagine a couple of days back, we had a huge rain in this part of the world, which is, which today we have 40 to 5 degrees Celsius, still we had a huge rain. So those sort of um, complete devastating weather events could mean that we have to prepare to adapt to such a fast changing climate weather, even in this part of the world where rain is scarcely available throughout the year. So the rain we received was like first time in 27 years. See, that's how the variation of weather takes place. Our community prepared for that. Well, the example shows on the media, they weren't prepared. And this is where we have to build the community's resilience to, you know, to help them to uh, how to adapt to the situation, how build that um, policy and uh, uh, necessary implications on the ground and how we support our government also. So I think we all have a great role in that. And uh, I think all our projects which have been mentioned here has its own tangible impacts on our community. And this is what we have been doing here in Qatar. Fantastic. Then we have several initiative lessons learned. Thank you very much again for your leadership, for your commitment, for inspiring other youth to make this transformation possible. And now we are going to move in working groups. The, we want to hear from all of you. We will have five facilitators. One of them will be Manal, a group number one. We will have Mohamed Marai from the Libya Youth Climate Council for Climate Change. Um, Mohamed, please raise your hand that people can see you. Then we have also Sarah Abu Taya eh, from the Arab Youth Sustainable Development Network in Jordan. Please also raise your, uh, your hand, Sarah. Eh, Nishad will be another of the facilitators. And we have Tarek Hassan. Tarek, also raise your hand, then people can see you. Eh, I think that uh, Tarek eh, has a difficulty. Then, eh, Abdallah, if you can take this group. Basically, in the working groups, we are having Three key, uh, three key questions. The first one is, I want that you imagine how a climate resilient MENA region look like. No, 
just thinking post 2030, we have the sustainable development goals, how it will look like. And then the second key question is, what are these five key actions to enable the transformation? These are the, the exercises, thinking and imagining a climate resilient for the MENA region, how it will look like. And second, what are the five key enabling actions for this transformation? The uh, IFA uh, will help us to move into the working groups and uh, and after that, uh, what I will request is I will invite one person from each working group to, if you can define who will be uh, presenting the conclusions and then to socialize the, the main conclusions. Then please stay with us. We are, divide, we are going to divide the group in different uh, small groups and uh, just let's have a very interesting discussions in the working groups. So Adriana, do you mind also dropping the questions in the chat so can so that everyone can see them? Thank you. The methodology for that, we will have five working groups. They, what they suggest is that you select one of the group from one to five, and then just go directly to one of the working groups. And the working group you can select uh, in the bottom. Then if you go to the bottom, you will have the possibility to select a working group and join the conversation in the working group. If you go to the, the um, when we just have more, it says join breakup room, just uh, select there, and then you will go to a working group. I see uh, still we have uh, many participants in this uh, uh, group that will be moderated by Atala. Then just go to the join uh, breakout room and select uh, one group over there. We have a room number one, two, three, and four. Then I invite you, we have still uh, 30, more than 30 participants in this working uh, group. Then I suggest that please select one of these and uh, uh, to start with the conversation. The idea is that we have uh, 10 participants in this uh, room. Then please join uh, any other room and we will start with the conversation. Then over to you, uh, Atala, if you want to start with the conversation in this working group. Okay, thank you, uh, Adriana. 
and I think the questions are now in the chat. Can everyone see the questions? Okay, so this is not a, a discussion, like a panel discussion. So I need like to be, uh, I need you to be interactive with me. So if you feel free to to open your camera, so I can like see the people who are brainstorming with me. Hello, hello. I, I don't want to be like this kind of teacher that. Okay, you are the next one opening your camera. I, I just want to be a friendly. So please, if you can open your camera, go on. And um, also, if you have like uh, any inputs on, on the two questions asked in the chat, which is what are the climate resilience in the MENA region post 2030 looks like? And also, what are the five actions that can uh, enable transformal uh, transformation uh, change in the MENA region? So who uh, want to contribute and have like uh, some thoughts, some ideas? Um, yeah, you want to like just comment, ask me some question. <laughs> yeah, just step in. Maybe you start with uh, Abdala. How do you imagine a climate resilient uh, region? Okay. Um, of course, I, I can start. So, um, so we need to think. Uh, for uh, the future, as we can think of today. So uh, if you are looking today for the cases that we already face, uh, the problem that we're already uh, facing, the crisis that we're living, uh, see how it will um, look in the future. And this is uh, how it's going to, uh, to give us uh, an, a small uh, portfolio of what's uh, going to be faced in, uh, in two, after 2030. So we have two mini scenarios uh, in IBCC and we want to stick to the most reasonable one, which 1.5 to keep 1.5 alive, because as we can see, uh, we, we all do this kind of um, sessions, workshops, webinars, we go to COPs and SPEs just for one reason to, to keep the Paris Agreement on the table, to keep uh, 1.5 alive. So uh, what we all wish that we can, uh, by the year 2030, we already have like uh, the emissions are more uh, reduced and also we are having more new um, eco-friendly projects. So how can we do this? By uh, empowering youth that are working in the field of climate change uh, by giving them uh, the opportunity and the space to start their own projects that uh, relate to the climate field and also to uh, uh, help new companies and also the existing companies, the big companies, that they are because they are in the industrial field, they make a lot of pollution during the, the production uh, phase. So we need to help them to go green, to have this, uh, you know, just transition. So it's going to be just transition after a while. You just need to stop using fossil fuel and start to use renewable uh, energy resources. And this can be done by uh, very big organizations that are going to give support for these organizations, for these companies and this uh, industry to to move to to the green side. Also, we can do uh, we can as youth uh, put a pressure on uh, our governments and decision makers by telling them, okay, this is our future. We cannot like uh, stay like bare hands and just wait until everything is done. We need to start making an action by ourselves. We need to um, have our voice here. That's why there is platforms like local coi like uh like koi like this kind of forum here that's going to have the uh, the output document after six uh forums in the cop as well so this all like this is uh, the some of the solutions that we as views can offer to the decision makers and now it's in your hands to to do the action to implement what we already suggested so this is uh, some of the ideas that I have to uh, to see how 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 it will look like. It will look like uh, I, I'm, I will be the optimistic one. It will look like um, like the region is going to have um, 
at least like a climate pact between the, the, the MENA region or the, the Arab countries because uh, we are in the same regions sharing the same uh, problems, uh, crisis, because now if, if I have like a, a flood in, in, um, in Libya, it will affect Egypt. Uh, and also uh, the same in the, the Gulf country. If you have like a, a, a very big heat wave, it will affect all the other countries. So we need to have like a climate pact or something in the future. And also we need to have like an a, 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 a incubator for, for youth projects uh, in the region that can like, okay, I will just pick like 10 projects this year and I will just focus on them and make them big, big, big projects that are going to solve the specific problem that's the country is facing. So this is uh, some of the, the the points that I can see, like how the region it will look like uh, post 2030. Fantastic. Then now I, I also see that there are many comments here directly in the chat, but uh, let's use the opportunity that we have the microphone. Uh, Nora, if you would like, uh, I, I can see Nora Mohammed. if you would like to talk directly, please use the floor. Uh, also, also, guys, uh, there is an uh, interpretation. So, if you want to speak in Arabic, لو عاوز تحكي بالعربي, تك تك تكلم عادي مفيش مشكلة. There's someone who are going to 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 translate. So, no worries if you have like uh, this language barrier thing. Hello, yes. assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. أنا نورا من اليمن. طبعا من خلال السؤال المطروح هنا الذي طرحتم كيف سيكون عذرا فقط الترجمة حتى يبدو واضح للجميع في ترجمة شغالة معك وانت شغالة فما تقليش من نظري اوكي طبعا تفعيل دور الشباب الفاعل ولاحظ الآن أن اتجاهات الشباب نحو المنظمات نحو المؤسسات الشبابية التي تهتم بالمناخ أو بأهداف التنمية المستدامة لاحظت الكثير طبعا من النشاطات الأخيرة كنت ألاحظ تقريبا في فلسطين وهذا ما جعلني أشعر بالسعادة الشديدة كذلك في اليمن وفي ليبيا كذلك وجود مؤسسة تعنى بالتنمية المستدامة هنا في اليمن كذلك تناقش أحد أهداف التنمية المستدامة من ضمنها المناخ كذلك وتعريف الناس بمخاطر أو بالمخاطر التي قد تلحق بالمناخ جراء ما يقوم به الناس من ممارسات خاطئة وغيرها ومما يؤدي إلى مخاطر كبيرة على الناس منها الاحتباس الحراري وغيره جميل ما يقوم به الأخوة هنا أتمنى وأتوقع أن يكون لها دور كبير في العوام القادمة منها إقامة مؤسسات شبابية بذات شبابية هناك شباب فاعل ينتظر الفرص أو ربما قد لا يعرف الفرص المتاحة مثل تماما كنت قبل فترة أبحث عن ربما مثل هكذا موضوعات تناقش عن المناخ عن التنمية المستدامة عن البيئة وغيرها وجدت أيضا بالصدفة في بعض الإعلانات الممولة وحاولت أن أنضم إليكم مثل اليوم أتمنى أن أكون لدي دور فاعل كثيرا لكن ربما أحتاج اللغة بشكل كبير لاحظ أتمنى أن يكون لليوم أيضا مثل هكذا مؤتمرات يكون لها توضيح أكثر عانت قليلا في البداية في الترجمة وغيرها أيضا لا يوجد جداول بالعربي شكرا لكم ذلك كان التوضيح البسيط بالنسبة للسؤال قد أجبت عليه في البداية وأتمنى أن يصل تصل مثل هكذا مؤسسات ومنتديات إلى الدول مثل اليمن وغيرها ممن يسعى الشباب إلى إيصال صوته في ظل ربما ظروف صعبة على الشباب شكرا شكرا جدا لك يا نورا يعني ونعتزل لو لو هي الفورم مش كلها بالعربي لكن احنا في المينا ريجون مش كلها ارب كانتريز 
ومش كلهم العربي بتاعهم كويس فاحنا عشان كده عندنا انتربريتيشن عشان خاطر تسهل الموضوع علينا ان احنا نفهم حاجه زي كده وبالطبع برضو الجدول نزل باللغه العربيه وحاولنا ان احنا ننشر على صفحه مثلا اكس سستينابل باللغه العربيه فتقدر اللي انت تتواصل على حاجه زي كده واتمنى اللي يكون ده بدايه كويسه ليكي ان انت تخشي في المجال وتسمعي الحاجه باللغه الانجليزيه وتسمعيها بالحاجه باللغه العربيه فبالتالي تنمي الجزء دوت وشكرا جدا طبعا على اجابتك واردك I'm going to move back to English. <laughs> so, uh, I'm going to move back to English. Maybe you can do uh, no because we will very soon move to uh, we will move to the plenary again. Then just very briefly because I think that there was a, a technical issue. You just can give the two sentences, the, the summary of the intervention in Arabic and uh, if there is any other intervention before we close this working group in, in two minutes, stay over to you. But first, Abdallah, maybe a brief summary of the intervention. So she was speaking uh, merely about uh, the, the situation in Yemen uh, because uh, Yemen now is looking for uh, one of the main resources of living and climate change is not low on the table, so they need to Uh, put more effort on climate change if you are going to address this problem in a country like Yemen. Uh, and she hoped by the year 2030, uh, the situation will be better and everyone in the country is now know uh, what uh, climate change is about. So uh, we need to start in the next like uh, uh, eight years to uh, implement Uh, more project and uh, work on the capacity building of uh, the youth in the country to uh, let them know exactly uh, like this kind of uh, platforms and uh, other platforms that discuss uh, topics, specific topics in the climate change and give them the opportunity to participate. And she was also uh, uh, speaking that why there is no, nothing in Arabic uh, in, in the MENA region. Uh, and I, I explained that to her that we already published in our Page, for example, in Egypt acts in uh, the Arabic language for, for the Arabic audience, of course, but we cannot uh, guarantee that all the people in the MENA region are going to understand Arabic. So we have like the interpretation here to help us. So this is uh, in brief what she, she mentioned. And that's it. Then we have one minute for the final intervention. If there is any other one. Amina, would you like to intervene or any other? Sorry, I didn't hear what is the question. Uh -huh. If you have any input about what are these actions that can foster a climate resilient region in MENA? Yeah, we already uh, we already uh, write them, and I'm not the one that I'm gonna tell them because I wanted to make a space for other people, our young people. So I think uh, one of the girls in our group, she's gonna take it. Her name is Watan. Fantastic. Then now we will invite everyone to return back to the plenary just to uh, share some of the insights. Then basically what I will do is uh, call the different groups. You can do a one minute summary about the discussion. Then now group number one, uh, uh, please go ahead. I, this is the first thing actually, well, there were so much ideas and we didn't have enough time to cover both questions. So we only covered the first one and I'll just quickly share my screen here. But I wanted to say to all the, act to all the participants who were involved in Breakout Room 1, we were amazing. And I really was inspired by, by your thinking and your perspectives about climate. And so we only answered the first question, sorry. Uh, but there were, there were, we had live experiences in terms of climate activism with UNDP, UN institutions, climate science, climate education, also yelled. Um, but the general overview was, um, in terms of agriculture, was to invest more in carbon sequestration, to reduce global warming and carbon emissions, and also to preserve the soil. Um, and as well, agriculture could leave, if not, if it is not sustainable, it could leave a lot of impacts on the weather and climate conditions that could get worse. Also in the main region, we should have more greener landscapes and balanced economy, um, especially in terms of circular economy that was mentioned by Lejeune afterwards, uh, which is here. 
So implementing economic uh, circular economy and linking climate activism with entrepreneurship, sorry for the typos here, um, and also creating job opportunities that was also mentioned here, creating job opportunities, career opportunities, education opportunities that are linked to climate and that will, and also economic cooperation between a lot of countries uh, for economic stability and as well political stability, I believe. And lastly, there was um, more investment in renewable energies and renewable energies, which is probably like mostly energy transition and investing in um, technology within the field. And uh, what else? Encouraging young people to work within this, encouraging young people for climate in general. Uh, sorry, I'm saying something. Um, but this is mostly what we've discussed. Again, I would have wished we had more time because it's just, it's been so great to listen to a lot of great perspectives from Pakistan, from Yemen, from Iraq, from Jordan, from other parts of the world. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks a lot, Manal. Then uh, the group number two. For the group number two, I would give the place to uh, Watan from Sudan to speak about what we had. We all answered all the questions and it was really a pleasure to meet all of them. Uh, hi, everyone. Can you hear me properly? Yes. Okay, so in our group, we had three questions uh, that we had discussions for. The first one is, what are youth priorities in the MENA region for the global goal on adaptation? So we thought of providing capacity building in regards to uh, inv inventing and adaptation measures, also to share practices and projects to work together in the MENA region to uh, think of climate solutions. And uh, thirdly, is to find means of funding to help implementing these project, projects. And lastly, is to enable MENA region to have national adaptation programs, uh, including youth and its mechanisms. Uh, so this is for the first question. For the second question is what it was, what are youth priorities in the MENA region post 2030 look like? So in this, uh, we thought of as we are in a region focusing on agriculture, we need to invent a new technology and integrate it in the agriculture mechanisms and also to work on the renewable energies and qualify people to mobilize them in these fields to invent solutions. Uh, also, as MENA region, we suffer from uh, floods crisis. We need to focus on water strategies and uh, to study the, the sea level raising and saving uh, islands and uh, also to highlight the biodiversity issues. Uh, also to um, work on our health systems to make it more resilient. And most importantly, to focus on like having democratic governance in the MENA region as an essential foundation to implement all these solutions. The last uh, round of discussion with, was about actions five actions that can enable transformational change in the MENA region. Uh, we thought of intense research as units to support finding climate solutions, to support renewable energies by investing in our resources, also to support youth advocacy and activism, establishing climate funds, prioritize climate education, and uh, lastly, include youth in negotiations. Thank you very much. Very rich conversation. The number, uh, group number three. Thank you so much. And uh, for the group number three, also we uh, come out with uh, points related to my colleagues' points. But for the first question, we um, uh, focused on raising the awareness and youth mobilization in uh, uh, like the priorities in MENA region for youth. And uh, also as youth, we envision that development is a key point that we uh, prioritize it in climate adaptation because uh, as it's always mentioned, we don't have another 100 year of development to become a develop developed country. So uh, we have to focus on like adaptive development um, uh, strategies and action plans in our uh, region. And also people need uh, matching uh, climate adaptation with their needs, their economics, their um, uh, jobs and their engagement in, in, our, in their daily lives. So that was basically uh, the uh, first question. And for the second question, um, uh, they envision uh, after 2030, the climate resilient region is a region with um, agriculture solution, um, water uh, facing no water issues because uh, we have uh, limited resources and uh, many issues with our water resources in MENA region. And 
Unfortunately, some of them are uh, impacted by political conflictions. So we envision after 2030 to not to have uh, such kind of issues in our uh, region. And for the third question, the five actions that we are um, uh, like um, hoping to, to have them, uh, raising the awareness and capacity building again for the youth and uh, the agriculture activities because most of our uh, countries in our region depending on that. So we increasing um, um, like more food security, uh, decreasing hunger crisis and so many uh, things. And uh, like also uh, some people from the group um, highlighted the participating of youth. We need more participation for youth in forums and in um, like decision making, a real decision making process. And uh, media exposure, because as you see any uh, were any um, um, crisis, any issue, um, the media exposure is important to spread the awareness among it. And we we witnessed that uh, through COVID-19. And the last thing was the green projects and the green jobs for youth, because we are talking about sustainability. We are convincing people that we, um, we are um, acting for sustainability, but they would never believe it until they see it. So uh, as as much as we um, increase our green economies and green projects and in, in like making includes inclusion for youth in green jobs, they will believe and be involved more in climate adaptation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Then we, let's move to the working group number four. Uh, thank you. We had issues. We have very few numbers and we couldn't jump into second question as such. Um, well, most of them who uh, actually spoke in our session or in our breakout session were very optimistic about the future for MENA region upon what is like you making sure that um, issues like wash, health, uh, environment are taken care. Also looking at the coastal uh, ecosystem and uh, how women are taken care would actually define how the future MENA will look like. So there were young people from uh, from uh, from Egypt. There was a colleague from uh, from Bangladesh also who was giving some inputs how Global South has to work uh, in collective way. As most of the time, the Global South, uh, the region who gets impacted by climate change, um, compared to the later other Global North countries. So the idea was to uh, look at uh, how young people can build on awareness. They find a lot of them doesn't really understand the climate issues and the solution required to them. So they re they want real tangible solutions to mitigate or, or adapt to climate change, and that was one of the key issues or responses. Um, and they were also embracing how the future would be uh, very important for them because they see this uh, the, the, a lot of changes happening in the region. The COP is bringing some much needed uh, inputs to the region, etc. So yeah, those are the concerns as well as some recommendations. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you very much. And then let's go to the final group. I think, Adriana, you, you can help me with this one because you already took some notes. Then I think that in the last working group, you were talking about there are, there are uh, different issues, but um, one is connected with the conflicts in the region and how to strain the institutions and to have the climate governance. The other thing is also connected about and also it was highlighted like how the, the, the MENA region will be the, that there is a period of time to concrete action in the next eight years and, um, and also connecting with the renewable energy. I think that there will be many others that will be part of the recording. But with this, I want to, to close. Uh, I want to say, first of all, thank you to everyone that have joined. This. Cheers for your uh, sharing your experience, your also view, your views, and especially also your call to action, a call to action to invest in youth development and uh, in youth initiative. Yeah, thank you so much for attending. Um, no, Abdul, I think we have to wait. There is a, a video from Mr. Uh, Amr Isam that yeah. will be shared.
I think that me and while yeah. I were waiting, I would love to stay in touch with all the amazing people here. So if anyone, everyone could just drop their social media um, links. This is mine. I just dropped mine. Please add me. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, that's you, Nishan. I want to say thank you to everyone uh, and also mentioning that the Global Center on Adaptation will continue organizing the other youth adaptation forums. The next one will be in Latin America on the 12th of August and we will have also a global dialogue that will be live stream bringing together youth and decision makers. If you have not registered yet as part of the Youth Adaptation Network, please uh, we will share the link with you and then you can join the network. Also join in our, you will in our newsletter, receive all the latest news. And we really hope that continue working with you. Finally, I want to uh, emphasize that this event has been possible through the collaboration of different partners, but especially uh, youth organizations that took the leadership, especially TENS, to the Arab Youth Climate Ma Movement of Qatar, the Libya Youth Climate Council, Act Sustainable in Egypt, the Arab Youth Sustainable Development Network, as well to the Ministry of Environment and Climate Change of the Emirates and uh, the co-presidency. And to close, we are going to share with you a message that we have from the COP27 presidency. We are preparing for the COP, the African COP, the COP of adaptation, the COP of implementation. And let me close this event with the message of our, um, the, our uh, Sam, who is uh, leading the engagement of youth as part of the COP27 presidency. Then let's watch the video. Distinguished participants, colleagues, friends, and inspiring young people. I'm pleased to speak to you today on behalf of Egypt's incoming presidency of COP27, taking place next November in the city of Shemeshit. Let me at the outset thank and congratulate Global Center on Adaptation. We were thrilled to learn that GCA is putting together a series of youth-focused adaptation dialogues. We are further thrilled that these dialogues started from Africa and trotted the globe to conclude with young people from Latin America and the Caribbean. And in this vein, the COP27 presidency is looking forward to the Global Youth Adaptation Summit to be held in the city of Rotterdam, 3rd and 4th September 2022. Distinguished participants, our meeting today comes weeks after the release of the six assessment IPCC Working Group to report on impacts, adaptation, and vulnerabilities, described by the UN Secretary General as an atlas of human suffering. The message is very clear, and indeed we need to feel alarmed and deeply concerned that we are significantly off track, and that the window of opportunity is rapidly closing. Adverse impacts of climate change are already here and cumulatively increasing in all regions and across all sectors, making us live already in an era of loss and damage. Latin America and the Caribbean region are among the strongly affected. Some progress is made on adaptation, but it is furthest from enough. Time is running out, resources are dismal, and adaptation limits are fastly approaching. Sharma Sheikh is expected to be the top of implementation. Adaptation should be at the heart of implementation, discourse, and action. The two years Glasgow Sharma Sheikh work program on the global goal and adaptation was launched in Glasgow through a series of policy and technical dialogues. Many voices are calling for seeing a qualitative accomplishment on the GGA discussions at Sharma Sheikh before the conclusion of the process at UAE in 2023. And first and foremost, there is a need for a transformative adaptation agenda. We look forward to your valuable engagements, inputs, and submissions on the road towards a GGA that captures your concerns, priorities, and challenges, and showcase the best practices of youth-led global and local resilient solutions. Meanwhile, it is imperative to continue to demand sufficient, meaningful, accessible, predictable, balanced, and appropriate climate finance for adaptation. The 50-50 mitigation adaptation climate finance must not be a theoretical construct, and the Glasgow pledge to double adaptation finance should be honored and sustained. As COP27 presidency, 
we committed ourselves to a science-based, balanced, transparent, and inclusive leadership that promotes equitable progress on all fronts and encourages a drive for additional ambition and strength and resilience. In addition, the momentum created in Glasgow needs to be maintained and geared towards implementation. Our objective and vision will greatly benefit from the input from, from and engagement with all stakeholders. And as a country with extended commitment to youth empowerment, and as the annual host of the World Youth Forum in Sharm el Sheikh, we will strive to ensure that youth are at the heart of this conversation, as key contributor to policy planning and implementation, as well as being most affected by the future impacts of the decisions we make today. For these reasons, we are very glad that it was mandated to have an annual youth-led forum starting from Sharm el Sheikh in cooperation with UNGU and UNFCCC Secretariat. Egypt aspires that this forum and the COP itself provide a conducive environment for, to all of you to network, disseminate, impart and receive knowledge, speak up and exert the right level of pressure on governments and all stakeholders. I say this while looking forward to recurrent and dynamic conversations with you before, during and after Sharm el Sheikh. I thank you. Lene, it is the message of the COP27 presidency, and it has been a very inspiring event. All of you, you are change makers, you are leading transformation, and what our key message is that we really need you. We need your passion, we need your energy, we need your creativity. We have a unique opportunity. We are living in a climate crisis, but also is the opportunity to build together a climate resilient future. And we need you to be leading this process. And um, I hope that it is our first youth adaptation dialogue, but it's just the beginning of a multiple initiatives that we are going to implement together. The Global Center on Adaptation will launch a toolkit for youth on adaptation and leadership, and will be available in English, French, and Arabic, and we will launch this at COP27. Then we look forward to continue working with you. I want to invite everyone to turn on the camera and to take a family photo to remember this moment when we host together the first youth adaptation uh, forum for the MENA region. And also thank you for the leadership of uh, Mohamed, Nishet, Abdallah, and Ahmed who make possible this initiative. You came with the idea to host this event during the European Youth Forum, and now it is possible. And it is an idea. If you have an idea, if you have a dream, you need to bring this together and work hard and establish partnership to make it possible. Then please, I can see that we have some cameras on, also special thanks to our interpreters and, um, and also to the GCA team for making this event possible. To Celine, to Jolene, but also to Ifa, who is working with uh, me and many of you know her, as you have been communicating, Thank you to everyone that had been behind the scenes to make this event a really inspirational event and making possible. Then a big smile, please, all of you.